Ryan Stanton here with ASEP Frontline, joined by one of our good friends today and on uh, Facebook Live as well as, as we record this, uh, Dr. Howie Mel. And we're up here in Washington, D.C., uh, in the catacombs of the Grand Hyatt for Leadership and Advocacy 2021. But this is a public podcast that we're putting together on some of the myths, because this week I, I actually spent five days in the emergency department, uh, came out to about 60 hours worth of work, and... Um, um, and, and heard a lot of things with, with COVID, um, with the folks that are there, the reason people have not gotten their vaccinations, um, coming into the hospital, feeling really terrible, getting admitted to the hospital. And so I thought about the idea that we should chat about um, some of these things. And we put this out there on the Stanton MD Everyday Medicine Facebook page yesterday at 9.30 a.m., uh, right before I went into work uh, yesterday. And we were going to chat about some of those myths. And so why not bring one of my uh, big, most fun, gregarious <laughs> emergency medi- medicine friends, Howie Mel, somebody I've known for years and years, and actually some of the, one of the first times we sat down to dinner uh, was at, up here in Washington, D.C. Yeah. together. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the myths and things that you, as the listeners, uh, have sent to us. And um, I'm going to start off with the one that I heard a couple of days ago, that the vaccine has actually led to millions of deaths. Uh, no. I mean, there's really not even an answer to that. It's it, it simply no. The question of deaths from the vaccine, you have to understand, first of all, what, what Varus is, right? Varus is the, the vaccine adverse reporting event, uh, adverse events reporting system, which uh, allows you to, which allows doctors and public health professionals and the public put in um, something that could occur mm-hmm. after. Now, my, my, my favorite example of this on a very controversial vaccine was Jardisil, right? Mm-hmm. So the Jardisil vaccine was, is the vaccine against uh, um, HPV. And when they started to do the events recording and they were doing the surveillance uh, for their testing, and you look and you'll see that there were deaths in the control group. The deaths listed in the control group would happen to be that five young girls um, who got the vaccine died in car crashes if they if they were in the control group and only mm-hmm. one died in a car crash when they weren't in the control group. That had absolutely nothing to do with the vaccine, yet all that data is there on Varus, mm-hmm. right? So all Varus is is somebody saying, hey, I died, or my, my loved one died, or my loved one got this, that, or the next thing. Um, and if they had recently gotten a vaccine within the prior 90 days, it gets listed, and then it gets studied. Now, the it gets studied part gets forgotten, right? So, so the, the great one was when, when it first came out about um, pericarditis, and you actually looked at the data on Varus, it actually initially showed that the vaccine's probably protective against pericarditis, mm-hmm. right? When you actually look at the, uh, at the number of pericarditis events that we see in the general pop public, and then you extrapolate off the numbers um, that were vaccinated and got pericarditis, you actually find out that you're less likely to get it if you got the vaccine. It's still listed as a concern, however, because you have to remember that the, the, the setup is designed to give you a preponderance of caution. Mm-hmm. And so, oh, well, we've had reports of pericarditis, we're gonna list it. Even though those reports are not actually, if you look at the annual incidence of pericarditis in the United States, they're, they're not at an increased risk, but we're gonna be cautious. There is no way that millions of deaths have gone unrecorded. First of all, millions of deaths going unrecorded is impossible. If you think about it, we have all, I think just about everybody listening to this at least knows of somebody who knows somebody who died, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And, you know, for those of us growing up, when we grew up, uh, everybody knows somebody whose uncle's brother's dad died in Vietnam, and we lost 55,000 people in Vietnam. So let's be honest, if there were millions of deaths in the United States, we'd be looking at a minimum, if we say millions, of one in every, there's 365,000, so you'd be looking at one in every 190 people has died from a vaccine, uh, we'd know about it. No, oh, absolutely. We can't cover that up. Yeah, so, and uh, um, that is, an abs- that's one that there's potentially, and you're talking about the giant hopper of information uh, with the vaccine reporting. Um, and so everything goes in that hopper, and then every, as it gets sorted out, whatever's at the end is that little trickle of what is actually associated with the vaccine versus 
you know, potentially the virus itself. We know the virus is many thousands of times more dangerous in terms of potential risks to you, complications uh, than the vaccine. And and we're at now, especially with the with the Delta variant, that um, it's not really a question of if. And and actually, a, a one of our Dr. Harrison, one of our intensivists this week, g- gave me a good kind of association that I really hadn't thought of directly. And the fact that everybody likely in the United States is going to get vaccinated for COVID. Now, the question is whether you get vaccinated with the vaccine that has been studied and we know the data or the one that nature created called COVID-19. They all work the same way relatively. All it is, the idea behind a, a, a vaccine is to fool your immune system into thinking that you've had it to make it build those protections against that virus and exposure. And with everything else, just like, you know, using an example of the smallpox, the vaccine much, much safer than the virus itself, and that's the whole goal here is, is well, which one you're going to get. And more effective, though. I mean, yes. Let's keep in mind, the, the most variant part of this particular virus is its capsid. Mm-hmm. Right? We know that its capsid changes. Mm-hmm. But the spike protein seems not to change as much. And when you are vaccinated with one of the mRNA vaccines, whether that's Pfizer or Moderna, you are vaccinated only against the spike protein, which is less variable. So if you look at it and you get, if I give you a shot, boom, of Moderna and your second shot, 100% of the antibodies that you make are against the spike protein. If you, if I give you, boom, I give you COVID, you're going to make the same number of antibodies. Like, let's say you make 100 antibodies, right? Um, but 40 of the antibodies that you make are going to be against the spike protein. 60 are going to be against the capsid. And the capsid may not look the same by the time the second infection rolls around, which is why we're seeing secondary infections at a much greater rate than we're seeing vaccinated infections. That's actually going to be a good question because that one is that one's actually coming up with regard to the natural immunity. So uh, this was actually one that we talked about early in the pandemic. Masks don't work. They work. They don't work. Okay. Maybe. So this is my area of expertise. This is yeah. So I, to I'm get a little, a little bit of background, so everybody listening knows kind of your background that you're just not making this up. So I'm actually in the in the midst. I did uh, my master's in public health in environmental and occupational health, and I specifically focused on environmental toxicology. And so per, personal protective gear. Um, I was a hazmat guy on a fire department for years before I was a doctor. I never wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a chemtrek first responder. Um, and I didn't get that job, damn it. Um, anyway, so, so studying how to protect people and how to protect myself on, on chemical scenes is, is, I literally spent two years doing mm-hmm. it. I, my, my, my capstone project was on treating viruses as occupational toxins, which proved quite prophetic over the past two years. But, um, so when you look at masks, you have to understand the way that this virus is transmitted, and, and, it, and it's a cross between public health language and, and human language, mm-hmm. right? Because when, when we talk about airborne to the average person, if you say, what does airborne mean? They say it's in the air. Well, that's not altogether true with this virus. It's not airborne because a true airborne virus will use Boyle's gas on, will diffuse so that if you, if you put a million particles into a million cubic feet of air, you're going to have one particle per cubic foot of air. Mm-hmm. If you launch a million COVID uh, viri into the air as they are contagious in, into a million cubic feet of air, you're actually going to have many, million, uh, many hundreds of thousands of cubic feet of air with no, with no COVID in it. Mm-hmm. Because COVID actually has to. Yes, it's a very small virus, yeah. but it doesn't exist that way, and it's not infectious that way in the wild, so to speak. It needs to be on a respiratory particle and gets inhaled. So it has to be on a little bit of spittle, a little bit of spit, right? Anybody who's lived in the upper Midwest or anywhere where it gets cold, you, get, you see your breath when it's mm-hmm. really cold. That's what it's on. It's on that steam. It's on, that, uh, it's on those teeny tiny little particles that we really can't see of water that come out of our mouths with every single breath. And those particles do go into the air. And, you know, if you're standing in a place that is crowded and hot, you know, I, we went to the National Museum with my, or the National Aquarium with my kids yesterday, and um, my youngest two aren't vaccinated, and they were, they were double masked, and they still wanted to leave after they were there for half an hour, because they actually understand this, I think, better than most, most other people. But they were saying, you know, Dad, it's hot, it's humid, 
the particles are going to be in the air longer. And, and they're right, mm -hmm. right? This is going to behave like water behaves in the air. The problem is, is that most people hear that and they say it's airborne. It's not. So if it were airborne, if it were truly just the virus that we're dealing with, you, you're right, masks would be utterly worthless. Mm -hmm. But masks absolutely do diffuse respiratory particles. We've known that for years. We've done that for years in surgery, mm -hmm. right? If you start doing surgery without masks, you're going to have a ton of infections because our mouths are dirty, dirty places, man, all right? I, I don't know where yours has been, and I don't want to know where mine's been, all right? But if we start having particles coming out of our mouths and all that, all that respiratory droplet stuff coming onto a surgical field, people are going to get infections. Mm -hmm. They're going to die. So we cover them with masks. What does that do? It actually it doesn't provide the seal of a respirator, but it blocks and it blows it and it diffuses it away. Likewise, if you're inhaling through a mask, you are inhaling the gas, and it will get... It will prevent that from coming in. Anybody's worn a mask, especially you know, a cloth mask, wear it, go out for a jog. Tell me it's not a little moist when, it come, when you come in. Mm -hmm. Wear it for a long period of time when you're not sweating. But wear it for a couple of hours. And it's always got that kind of warm, kind of you know, little wet feeling on the inside. That's because it's doing its job. It's protecting your respiratory particles from going out. Now you can still breathe. Gas is going to get around it. Gas is going to go right through it. Oxygen is going to come right through it. You know, there was that, that big debunked study where they, they measured the oxygen under. That's the, you can do the same study by measuring the oxygen in your mouth after you exhale. It has nothing to do with anything because there's going to be an exchange of that air. Um, it, it, it's designed to, to block respiratory droplets. It, we've, we've had studies from long before COVID that it does it very, very well. And if both sides are doing it, Right? If, if the person, if I'm doing it and I've got COVID or you're doing it and, and you got COVID, whatever, it's going to be a double layer that the, that the particles got to get through to mm -hmm. get to you. And, and they work. They absolutely work. But again, there is a limit. You can overcome it, right? If I take a whole cloud of steam and make sure that every particle has got a COVID virus on it and put you into that, that with, a, with a cloth mask or with a double layered um, surgical mask or whatever kind of mask you want short of a full face respirator, you're going to be exposed to it. And that's where we're talking about, like with the, especially in, in small contained spaces in, inside homes and, and buildings. If you're in a room long enough with people with COVID, even with masks on, you know, you get, you've got enough circulation at that point that you're going to have that increased risk of, of catching any exposures. But, you know, again, the masks aren't, aren't the hundred percent solution or that would have taken care of things. We see how beneficial uh, the steps were with the flu and RSV season. Yep. Uh, now that we're actually seeing RSV right now, as opposed to last winter, where I didn't see anything, I and mean, I'm still yet to see a positive flu since the last flu season, the 2019-2020 uh, flu season. And well, so, and, and what's funny is I work in St. Louis, which is a very non-mask area, and mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of it. We're seeing RSV. I actually, yeah, I've got admit, RSV I, I yesterday. Had to admit an adult for RSV. Lots of comorbid factors. Yes. But head to admit adult, we're seeing a ton of parallel influenza three. Mm -hmm. We've got um, that, which, and we're seeing a ton of flu. Mm -hmm. no, no flu for us, but we did. Interestingly, the year before the 2019-2020, uh, we actually had a, the the largest impact on RSV that year. With for us in, in my area was um, was elderly as well, and so we actually in, admitted a number with RSV versus kids. It seemed to more impact that year. Now they always say that crises bring out better science, and I think we're always going to have better science about respiratory bugs now because of, and I don't want to use it, I have nothing to do with the company Biofire, nothing. They actually gave my kid herpes. They did. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this, but at one scientific assembly, they had a big claw machine, and up comes my 12-year-old kid, and he goes in, and he pulls it out, and it's a little statue of herpes. Oh. So we joke that that kid got Oh, my gosh. I didn't, know where, the, I didn't know where that was going. Anyway, but the point being, um, Biofire has created this respiratory panel that a lot of us use for quick diagnosis mm -hmm. of RSV, and it happens to give us information about... Um, what is it, 14 different? I think some are, it depends. Like, I think ours is 26. So we're getting more information now about all the different respiratory mm -hmm. viruses. Like, I never, I, I honestly got to tell you, before COVID, before the biofire, I had never had heard of, I mean, I'd heard of it from microbiology, but I'd never heard of parainfluenza 3. I certainly didn't know if any of my patients had it. They yeah. had a viral upper respiratory infection. Oh, actually. Now I, now I can now I tell you exactly what a virus is. <laughs> two weeks ago, I walked into somebody, I walked into a room and said, hey, you have uh, coronavirus, but not COVID. <laughs> right. It was one of the others. It was off. It was off that test. All right. So you're a physician. I'm a physician, um, and we've heard this one a bunch. If somebody dies, we, you and I, are going to call it COVID just to boost the numbers 
whether for financial gain or just to propagate the, the entire pandemic. <laughs> so there's, you know, there's always this, this kernel of truth to every one of these rumors, and it's, it comes from misunderstanding of how hospital billing really works. When COVID first came out, people have to realize that we didn't have a billing code for COVID. There, there wasn't such an animal because mm -hmm. there wasn't right. such an animal. We didn't even know what the COVID was in, in initially. And so usually viral pneumonia is not a particularly tough disease to treat. Mm -hmm. Viral pneumonia, the, all these parainfluenza threes that we're talking about, these RSVs, you know, you looked at me kind of, whoop, we, I admitted an, an adult with RSV. I mean, this <laughs> never happens, right? It's rare. And so a lot of our repayment for different medical problems comes from these things called DRGs or diagnostic related groups. Basically, the federal government says, look, if you go into a hospital with pneumonia or you go into a hospital with a broken leg or you go into a hospital with this, that, or the next thing, on average, it takes $1,000 to treat you. Mm -hmm. And so they give the hospitals $1,000 regardless of how long it takes or how easy it takes. And the idea is, is that they would stop unnecessary tests because the hospitals would lose money if they kept on doing a chest x-ray every day that you were in with a broken leg. Or kept leg. you in the hospital too long. Right, There's exactly. Yeah. So there was not a DRG for COVID. And at first they were using viral pneumonia, but nobody spends 30 days on a ventilator for, for viral okay. pneumonia, typically speaking. So when they created the DRG for COVID, it was a much higher repayment than the typical viral pneumonia. And it became, if we were admitting somebody for COVID, it became important that we would accurately do it. Now, the hospital, don't get me wrong, the DRG still was losing money, and it's still underfunded if you, yes. if you look at it. Um, because it does, for some of these folks, they, spend, they, they can spend weeks on respirators, mm -hmm. weeks of inpatient therapy, um, and, and, and that's okay. I'm not, I'm not here to pitch for more money, but this is why when somebody says, oh, you're just putting it as COVID or COVID suspected to boost the numbers. No, we're putting it as COVID or COVID suspected because accurate billing requires accurate diagnosis. Now, when people heard that all of a sudden the payment for a viral pneumonia, right? So, so somebody who got it before we had this DRG, so you got admitted for pneumonia on, on you know, this week, and the bill from the hospital was $1,000 because they could only get the viral pneumonia. And then the next week, your neighbor, or two weeks later after this DRG was enacted, your neighbor gets admitted, and their bill is 10, and the bill of their insurance company is 10 times higher, and everyone went, ah, it's, it's, it's a nefarious plot. It's a nefarious plot. Now, as for the deaths, that doesn't change anything. If they weren't inpatient, putting down that somebody died of COVID mm. does absolutely nothing. And we have no interest in boosting the numbers. Guys, at the end of the day, what what people don't realize is, is that I'm scared of this damn thing too. All right, I, I have a wife who uh, has an immunocompromised state right now. I have uh, I have got children who can't get vaccinated. I, you know, I'm not uh, the most svelte guy in the planet. You know, and, <laughs> and and I don't mind telling you I got high blood pressure. You could assume it by meeting me for five minutes, okay? I don't want this thing out there any more than anybody else does. But but science has to be accurate. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, and, it, and it's amazing to me that, you know, in, in everybody's dark, what's been the biggest honor of my job, and I think yours too, and I think most of us in emergency medicine, is the trust that people give us, right? They come to us, they're dying, and they're looking at us to, to save them, and they trust us to do the right thing and to save them. And then all of a sudden, this thing comes around, and everyone's like, oh, you're lying. Like, dude, no. I mean, first of all, if I wanted to make something into a bigger deal or do it for more money, there's, there's stuff that pays better than COVID. Right? I mean, you know, we're doing this because it's the truth and we're trying to get the science and we're trying to get people and our communities better. So the vaccine, th here's one that, that I've heard, and, th and this one's actually kind of an interesting topic, um, and this being that vaccine is made of aborted baby tissues. Ha ah, so this is the glimmer of truth one again. Yes. So there is a line of human cells that t drugs are tested on. And remember, it's something in the neighborhood of 70% of all drugs that are authorized in the U.S. are at least in phase one testing, tested against these cell, this cell line. Mm -hmm. And what this was, was aborted tissue from the 70s that has since been reproduced and reproduced and reproduced and reproduced and reproduced and reproduced. There is no baby left. There is not even the semblance. But what basically happened was imagine if you needed to have a hand, a perfect model of a hand for some reason, and they took an aborted baby's hand and they put it into a, castor mold, a plaster mold, and they made a master mold of this hand. 
And then every time you needed a hand, you'd pour plaster into that mold, and you'd have a hand, right? That's what's happened. They, they, a long time ago, they took aborted fetuses, and they created a series of cell lines. And these are DNA that can be used as a master template to create a, a, a bunch of human cells that you can then test cellular toxicity of drugs on. And yes, they, those came from aborted tissue. But they are no more aborted tissue now than it would be to take a plaster mold. And, and in actuality, nowadays, it would be you took, a, you took a mold of a baby's hand, you poured plaster in, you made a plaster hand, and then you made 20 more molds, and then oh, you poured him. plaster hands in that, and then you made 20 more molds after that. And so is it bioethically, at least the Catholic Church has come out and said no, it's not. It, 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 it's, it's reprehensible uh, from a moral standpoint for certain faiths that that was ever done. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is that now what it really boils down to is a, is a, is a series of, of letters that encode for DNA of a certain, you know, several billion lengths. And, and it's, it's, it's a written, it's essentially a, a written record of what that baby's DNA looked like. There is no portion of the tissue that is that way. And unfortunately, if you want to object to um, the way the mRNA virus was tested, you are going to have to give up just about every drug developed after 19, well, probably fully promulgated around 1980. So you're going to be left with, you know, kind of aspirin, penicillin, and maybe Lasix. Is Lasix before? The, you're going to have, I, you know, you're going to be very limited. It's going to be, be view, very few. It's, it's, sev it's 70 percent of all drugs in the United States for any purpose have exactly that same test. Now, so, but, it, but again, you have to look for the kernels of truth, right? Mm -hmm. These things are not giant conspiracies. They're the way things are done. And, and, and this is, I think, one of the biggest and, and most tough parts for uh, people to understand is the, the people who do this stuff, the people who do public, I have my master's in public health. I spent years training this. My wife has her master's in public health, and, and she'll continuously remind me. She, she's, hers is in policy and mine's in talks, and she'll, she'll tear into me about some facet of policy <laughs> that I just don't know. Public health and epidemiology and these things are, they're disciplines and they have a lot of study that go behind them. It's not just, hey, I'm a doctor or, hey, I'm a nurse. Nurses don't, they, nurses, I love my nurses. And they get a public health, an intro to public health class as part of nursing school. But that's, that's nothing. We get a couple, you know, we get an intro to public health class in med school. Mm -hmm. It's nothing. Um, this is deep stuff, and then we start talking about laboratory epidemiology, you start talking about uh, cell lines, you start talking about these, these PhD MDs that are so wicked smart that they, they you know, I, I, it's hard to be in the same room. I gotta look stuff up. I, 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 one of my mentors, a guy by the name of Matt Steinkreiser, I swear to God, I have to look up stuff after I talk to him and then come back and revisit. You just Google it while you're sitting there with him. I try to. <laughs> yeah. So this one, this one is actually one that uh, came from a few people. So Melissa David... Jesse Grimm, Miser, Andrea Michelle, um, you know, these, all these have had, uh, mentioned the same one, and this is one that we've all heard before, and that's the whole idea that the vaccine no. causes fertility well, well, issues. Well, first of all, let's face facts. So what does, the, what does the vaccine do? Let's break this down. If you get the mRNA vaccine, mm -hmm. okay, what it does is it goes into your cell, and it it causes your cell to replicate, to turn all of its intracellular machinery into making a spike protein. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens when you get the virus? The virus goes into your cell and it makes your cell replicate everything of the virus, spike protein and all, right? In both cases, it, your cell pops and the proteins come out. Spike protein, in the case of the mRNA vaccine or the, um, uh, the whole virus and its capsid in the case of, of a viral infection. And then your body responds to it and attacks it. Now, if this were true, it's not, but if this were true, then COVID would also cause infertility because all that is happening is, is that you are making a spike protein. If a spike protein causes infertility, then COVID infection will cause infertility. It, it has to. It's the same structure. The same structure exists 
that we're making our antibodies to in both the wild virus and in the shot. So you can't, if you're going to say, hey, listen, I'm gonna become infertile if I get um, the shot, so I'm gonna wait, you know, I'm just gonna risk it, then you're gonna become infertile if you get COVID. And to say nothing of the fact that then when you get COVID, you will have, we know this for a fact, vascular damage and nerve damage that can make it mm -hmm. much more difficult to go through a pregnancy. It, it's strictly bunk. The other thing that you have to realize too is, is that we're dealing, the spike proteins only hit the ACE2 to the best of our knowledge. And we've mm -hmm. immunotagged these, so we're pretty sure. Um, but the, the, to the best of our knowledge, these have only um, caused, uh, th there are no a ACE2 receptors in the, uh, there's not much in the way of ACE2 receptors that would be involved in fertility or infertility issues. But I think the biggest one of them all is, you, now how old are your, your daughters? 13 and 11. And you're 13 year old vaccinated? Yes. So you're completely willing to risk your, your future grandchildren, right? So am I, right? So my, so my daughter, uh, my, my eldest daughter is, is vaccinated and my second daughter is literally counting down the days to her 12th birthday um, so that she can get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. hey, yo, the, the proof here is in the pudding. No one's going, no, no, no doctor is going to put our, our children's fertility at risk. This is, this is scaremongering. This is, this is fear mongering. This is, this is people that are trying to create a narrative that are going after a vulnerable population. And, and, and I get it, especially people struggling with fertility or who have families that are struggling with infertility, that's heartbreaking. And, 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 it, and, it, and it creates a vulnerability because people, it's such a deeply personal and challenging thing for someone to go through. Um, and, and that makes, that makes people very apprehensive to do anything that could hurt their fertility and it makes them a great target for snake oil sales people and for, uh, for anti-vaxxers. And misinformation, that's for sure. And I can tell you right now how rough COVID is on, on pregnancy itself. Like when a pregnant female um, gets COVID, it is, it is rough. Um, so, you know, I, I actually saw several this week. Um, this one I can answer on my own because I've got type O blood. I'm O positive. If you have type O blood, you can't get COVID. I got COVID at Thanksgiving last year. Uh, it was no fun, no good. Actually, any blood types can get uh, COVID at all. So we've, I, we kind of teased earlier in the podcast with the idea that um, natural immunity. So John, uh, John Walsh, and actually a couple mentioned it. So and so got the vaccine. Uh, no, that, that, this, that's going to be a different one. Um, I'll ask that one in a minute. Um, there's the one associated with if you've had the vaccine, uh, so Andrea Lancaster Schaefer, I have a healthier, robust immune system, so I don't need the vaccine, or I've had COVID, so I don't need the vaccine. Well, again, the healthy, robust immune system argument is bunk. Um, actually, a healthy, robust immune system will actually help you transmit the virus, uh, because really what happens when you deal with this is that the cell gets entered by the virus, and the um, your body sees that your cell is not doing what it's supposed to. It's mm -hmm. actually becoming a virus machine and it attacks that cell. It's called a hunter killer cell. We actually have those in our body. I think you can make a great movie. They try to cool most of Jones, but the, like really we've got such cool, like um, <laughs> the way that the, the, the system works. But you, but if you actually have a really healthy immune system, you're going to attack those cells that are becoming um, uh, virus factories more effectively, you're going to cause the apoptosis, which is actually going to cause the intracellular spread of the disease. If you had somebody whose immune system was absolutely shut down, the virus would actually spread slower in their system because the virus requires a healthy immune system to spread. It requires um, the body to make those cells that are filled with virus erupt through apoptosis. It requires the inflammatory mediators um, to, to bring the lymph to the area so that those things can spread. Um, so this whole idea of I've got a healthy immune system is gonna protect me. You get a healthy immune system, it's gonna screw you. Okay, I mean, that's, it's like my daughter has anaphylaxis to peanuts. It's because she's got an over <laughs> aggressive immune system. That's actually what happens. Yeah. And so, so no, that, that one is absolute bunk. Um, and the same thing goes to, too, if you have um, gotten the disease and you say, I don't need it. That's half truth, right? Mm -hmm. You probably don't, but if you face an 
infection with a very, with a, even a slight variant. We're not even just talking Delta variant here. We're talking about just some mutagenic shift, right? You can still be considered within the Bravo or, or, or the Alpha, um, but the capsid has shifted. Remember that a, a percentage of the, of the uh, antibodies that you're making are not against the spike protein. They're against the uh, capsid, and the capsid can change and does quite frequently. And so you can either have 100% protection against the, the least mutable mm -hmm. portion, or you can have 40% protection against the least mutable portion and 60% that will work great if you are exposed to exactly the, exact the same, same strain. One, which is not what we're seeing. Right. Uh, you know, so it, this worldwide, what uh, worldwide spread, and that's it. Is is the the vaccine allows for a very a much more broad protection. So it it the idea of what you're talking about with the capsid is your immune system will protect against everybody wearing a red coat. Well, on occasion it's gonna wear it, it's gonna change coats. It's still the same thing. It may would be wearing a, a a blue shirt right now or a, a pink shirt or salmon. Um, it's the same. <laughs> it is. Pull it off. It is. Back. So. You know, so then it's like, oh, you're good. Come on through. You're good. We don't recognize you. But what we're looking at with the vaccine is it's, it's going to say, okay, everybody who walks through this room that's got any shirt of any color on, we're going to stop them. You. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna frisk them down and find out what they're here for. Absolutely. And that's exactly what, what the idea of the vaccine is, is that more broad uh, spectrum aspect. Let's get to John's question. So-and-so got the vaccine and still got COVID. So we're talking about breakthrough cases. We're actually seeing some breakthrough cases, yep. but more with Delta. So why put yourself at, quote, risk of the vaccine if you're going to get COVID anyway? So I, what I got to tell you is if you get the vaccine and you got COVID anyway, you were exposed to a fairly large dose of the virus and your infection was going to be awful. Mm -hmm. Because if you started out with, and again, I'm going to use really small numbers here because the actual numbers are unknown, but they're huge. But if you start out with 100 antibodies against spike protein and those became overwhelmed and you still got infected, then imagine if you didn't have those, <laughs> right? Your infection would have been uh, thousands of times worse and death would have been would have been likely. And when you look at the breakthrough infections as far as causing hospitalizations or death, they're unbelievably minimal. Also, when you look at the number of, of unvaccinated versus vaccinated that we're seeing right now, Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's 95% unvaccinated, and when you talk about hospitalizations, it gets to like 99, and when you get to deaths, we're talking about, you know, tenths of percents um, for the vaccinated and, and, and lots more for the others. But that doesn't make it not a problem, right? Because then you're going to say, well, that's my choice. I choose to get sick. But I got to tell you, I'm in St. Louis, in the St. Louis area, and I had a patient um, the other day who had uh, a, a very bad process. He had an infection. Um, uh, near their near their spine and they needed a level of service that I could not provide and I literally was calling as far away as um, Wisconsin um, to try and find a hospital that had all of the the services that this person needed and eventually we, we had to talk to, to this person's family and basically say look we're gonna do the best we can to temporize this mm -hmm. because every hospital that we tried to move this person to we couldn't because they are all over, over, overcrowded. The ICUs are full again. Uh, certainly in St. Louis, the ICUs are absolutely full. Um, but even when we are starting to get to Springfield and we're starting to get up by Chicago, uh, the hospitals are were overwhelmed again. And when we talked about flattening the curve, um, now we're the, now unfortunately we need the curve to be even flatter because so many hospitals are downstaffed. Uh, from COVID and can't get staffed back up. Um, there's lots of people who've retired from nursing, from medicine, and certainly from, from housekeeping and, and all the other supports, uh, services that we need. And, and we're not, we don't have beds anymore mm -hmm. for stuff that's not COVID. And so if you're sitting here going, well, listen, I don't have to, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to insist on people or I'm not, you know, I got my vaccine and so I'm going to be fine. And I think everyone should have the freedoms and whatever else. Realize that everybody's at risk by, by this behavior. Uh, because the hospitals are becoming overwhelmed again, like literally don't have the room, don't have the capacity. Um, our hospitals have been on weights. Uh, I don't know what, what your ER status is, but you know, the, the ERs are, are crowded again. Um, and we don't, we don't have the, 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 where, the stuff to do. If we, if we maintain what we've done the last two to three weeks for the entire year, we will uh, 2021 will be a 20% jump in volume versus 2019 
Um, so we are actually way past where we were before. Um, and, you know, all those things, you know, with the, with the bed availability and access, and, and it will, it will ripple, ripple effect across. And, uh, and French, the vaccine is an unapproved experimental drug with no research. And I wanted to hit this one because it's also, uh, it's not FDA approved, right? They're both kind of there. Kim, uh, oh, yeah, Kim, Kim, well. Kim got that one. Um, so, um, it, so the best way I can describe it, and I did this with one of my neighbors um, who happens to be a train conductor. Mm -hmm. And I said, so listen, um, they, they crash test your trains, your boxcars, right? He says, well, yeah. And I said, okay, so what, what was in your boxcars when they crash tested? He says, I don't know, I think they were empty. I said, oh, okay. So how do we know that that boxcar works in a crash, in a train crash, if it's got stereo equipment in it? He goes, well, because we did that test. And I said, oh, okay. What, what, if, we've, what if we've got microwaves in it? Well, it's the same as if, when we did the test and when it, when it had the stereo equipment in it. I said, right, mRNA vaccines have been tested and around for a long time, mm -hmm. right? It's a, it's a method by which we can bring a cargo into a cell. What we hadn't found before COVID was a cargo that did anything, right? But the mechanism of getting that in works. And so the same as it's ridiculous to say that you have to te crash test a train car or a tractor trailer with every possible load it's going to carry in order to say that it's crash safe, is bunk, right? It's the same thing. We happened to, we were able to quickly isolate the spike protein. We were able to quickly tell that the spike protein was kind of part of what defined COVID to be COVID, right? And we were able then to target it and create a cargo for the mRNA vaccine that worked. And we've got it now. And, and actually there's others. Breast cancer. There's a breast cancer vaccine. Mayo is in uh, is in trials that are looking incredibly fantastic because they were finally able to isolate in one specific form of breast cancer, in triple positive breast cancer. They were able to def to define one part of this of of, a, of this cancerous cell that seems to exist in every triple positive cell with breast cancer. Now we got a target, right? We couldn't do this with AIDS. We couldn't do this with the with influenza because they change so fast. They mutate. The parts that we can see, the parts that the body can, can attack, change. It, it, to use your example, they, they change from a red coat to a blue coat to a black coat to a black, and we can't find something that is a coat that isn't existing in our current cells, right? Because you can't do that. You can't have it attacking mm -hmm. cells of our own. So the idea that it's an unapproved, unapproved experimental vaccine is a bunk. A, it, it does have a, an EUA, and we've done lots with EUAs before. This is not, uh, we, again, it goes back to like the N95 respirators and my frustration because everyone thinks N95s were built for COVID. They, 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 N95s for, for literally decades. Right? And wasn't prim primarily for healthcare. They, they weren't, right. They were primarily designed for business. Mm -hmm. But my point is, we've had them for a long time. We've had an EUA, and the process for doing EUAs for a long, long time. As a matter of fact, many of the same people who are who are railing against the fact that this is under an EUA are the same ones who will rail against the fact that we don't give an EUA to promising-looking drugs that are for you know for this cancer or for that. Cancer. When the United States is always seems slow. to be a little, yeah slow. That's always the response. Is why is this available in Europe or Canada or wherever? And, it may and be. it's not available to us. And, and and you won't even use the EUA process. The EUA process is robust mm -hmm. and. We have, we have literally millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of data points. What we do know is, is that COVID in the long run, we are now seeing, because we've got more experience with long-term COVID than we do with long-term vaccines, we have absolute evidence that COVID in the long run is absolutely harmful. It's harmful to neurophysiology. It's harmful to vascular physiology. We know that. Your kid gets COVID. I think we're going to see a, a, a generation of kids in 10 and 20 years from now who are going to have early pulmonary disease, early cardiac disease, and are definitely going to be more susceptible to stroke than we've ever had. And we're going to have mm -hmm. an explosion of these problems. We're already seeing an explosion of, of cardiac um, stuff and vascular stuff and pulmonary stuff. Um, and we're not seeing any markers of that with, within, uh, within those who are vaccinated. So. The other thing about FDA approval, and I don't want to—I don't want to um, to alarm anybody here, but I, you know, we're going to start a little—we're going to start a little bit here. If 
they give FDA approval, but mind you, they lose the right to restrict it. So you and I both know as doctors, we can prescribe things off label if they're mm -hmm. FDA approved. Correct. One of the reasons that they are slow to FDA approve this is, is that it will go out of the control that they have over it. So I'll be able to off label prescribe it to a child. I'll be able to off label prescribe a booster. Under an EUA, physicians are limited in how they can give out the vaccine because we can only do it according to what is very specifically written in the EUA. You give this drug full approval and we can use it how, uh, the same way we can use any other drug. And that is on, on the best of our medical thought and in, in, in the best of our professional opinion. So the company can't advertise it. And that's, in that case, it kept, the company can't advertise it for uses outside of whatever their approval is, but there aren't restrictions in terms of licensed physicians and, and providers being able to to um, prescribe it or administer it in, if they see fit on somebody they think, they, they think will benefit. And so that's one of the reasons I think that you're seeing the CDC and the FDA saying we're going to keep this under the EUA is because it actually gives them greater control over how and um, when it's provisioned. Because I've already seen on social media several docs say, come on, bring it on, make this thing, because yeah. I'm going to start, I'm going to give it to my 10 year old, I'm going to give it to my nine year old, I'm going to get, get a booster. And, the, and currently the FDA doesn't want those things to happen. And that's probably more behind the politics of why we're not approving it fully than, than anything else, because <laughs> it'll be open season. Two quick ones. First, from Tracy, the vaccine alters your DNA. I heard this one as it first came out oh, quite a bit. It's, it's going to change your DNA. You're going to grow a tail. You know, I, I wouldn't mind being able to climb buildings and... And, and spin webs from my wrist. If we but. could alter DNA like that, um, we would. I mean, think about think about all the diseases that are out there that are DNA derived, right? The type one diabetes, where you lose the protein, you lose the ability to make the protein to make uh, insulin. Mm -hmm. If we could manipulate DNA on a broad scale, we would. We would have done it by now. We would have done it by now. It, it does it. it. It works the same way that a virus works. It hijacks the machinery in cells to create a protein that's not encoded for in the human genome. Not DNA, a protein. In this case, the spike protein. And your body will attack it the same way it attacks an infection. That's why you get side effects. That's why some people get side effects from the shot and why the side effects are much more on the second shot mm -hmm. than the first is because your body is responding to it. It, it. it is actually a form of an infection. It's just incredibly self-limited because it because it doesn't encode for its own replication, whereas the virus does. All right, the final one, and this is, this one's going full tin hat. Microchips and a number for tracking. The sweet. whole purpose of the whole thing is, to, is for the government to be able to track you. Totally sweet, right? Because if we could do that, this isn't where we'd start. Now think about this. How many kids, these are the same, the Venn diagram of the people who believe on this are, are probably very close to the Venn diagram of people who believe that there is massive amounts of human trafficking on the order of millions of children a year. Now, if I had a way that I could microchip and track, my daughter would have it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> right, wouldn't you want to know where your kids are all the time? Well, and see, my thought on this is the whole idea of you got your phone there. I do. We already we already have all the information that you want. That phone probably knows more about you than Absolutely you know does. about you, uh, and, and just because of your patterns that you the subconscious things that you do, the way that you search, what you search, what you view, how long you view it. That's actually the algorithms within. Um, you know, I've got Facebook pulled up here to get these answers on how long you're over an image or your your search engine. Where do you stop? And so it feeds that. So watch. All of a sudden, so mine. You know, my my is my feed. For Facebook is filled with epic fails because I love watching epic fail videos. I love watching the boats and they knock cars off and the car. I mean, it's just the epic fail stuff. So I, you know, I hover over there so I don't click on them. I just hover them for a little bit and watch a little bit of the video. But then all of a sudden, ten more pop up. But let me give you another thing about the phone, right? What's the biggest thing like they're always competing about is battery life, right? This one's got a battery life for this. This one's got a battery life for that. You could. We don't have the technology to make a battery in something that could track you, be in your, be that small to fit inside of a 27 gauge needle, and have juice running amount of time. If we did, 
Tesla's batteries would be, you know, the size of a, a shoebox. We just don't have that. It, it, it's full on tin hat. It is. But I do want to address one other full on tin hat okay. that does have a little bit of truth, and that's uh, Patrick Brookins. I know here in Colorado, the state was caught changing a death certificate from alcohol poisoning to COVID after that they began reporting deaths as COVID and those that died with COVID in their systems. People misunderstand. This is another public health thing. They misunderstand what is supposed to be death, what death certificates mm -hmm. are supposed to serve. So when they came out with that study that everyone loved to tout, it was actually, a, it wasn't a study. It was a, an, an edition of the MMWR, or the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report, where they said that um, six, only 6% 6 of people who died of COVID didn't have a comorbid condition. And actually, that study is completely wrong. 100% of the people who died with COVID, by the definition that they were using, should have had a, a comorbid condition. Listen, because COVID infection itself shouldn't be listed as the reason that you died. Mm -hmm. Because a death certificate is supposed to give information for epidemiologists. So what it should say is pneumonia caused by COVID-19. What it should say is heart failure caused by myocarditis caused by COVID-19 infection. And it should also list the things that were there at the time. Alcohol intoxicated, had been involved in a motor vehicle crash, had all of these things, and, and, and in the ones that, you know, a, a motor vehicle crash, so it should say, you know, death from uh, cerebral hemorrhage caused by a motor vehicle crash, other uh, coexisting conditions, active COVID-19 infection. Mm -hmm. That's not juice in the numbers, that's giving us an epidemiology here. And it's the same same studies that we use again to go back to that to, to that uh, to the bit about the HPV vaccine, right? Why do we record that these girls in the control group died in a car crash? Because epidemiology looks at everything, right? It looks oh, we got we got thrown off of Facebook. It must be a uh, <laughs> it must be a conspiracy theory, um, but it looks at everything. It looks at all of the data that are out there should be on there. So there never really should be a death certificate that says only COVID-19 infection. The other thing is to keep in mind, if you're gonna talk about comorbid conditions and you're gonna look at it, uh, the latest data suggests that somewhere around 73% of the United States is medically overweight or, or heavier. Mm -hmm. So if we're gonna say, oh, well, they all had comorbid conditions, a lot of that is the fact that their BMI is medically overweight. And that means three quarters of us. And then let's take into account that some of those, that one quarter that's not medically overweight may have other conditions. So you're gonna be talking on the order of 80 or 90% and the actual people, and, and, I, and I've had some really fit guys that I've argued with on Facebook about, um, oh, I, I don't have any comorbid conditions. I'm like, yes, you do. And they're like, I, I'm like, you're obese. They're like, no, man, I'm buff, I'm cut. Right, but epidemiologists look at BMI, they don't look at body fat. Percentage. Right. And if you're six foot, and you're 225 and you're ripped, right? I mean, you're just, you know, I'm Arnold, I'm big with muscle. Yeah, you're you're going to go down on a death certificate as obese. obese. Yeah, and because I've actually calculated that. That's what I tell people is that, you know, for me, you know, the, the, the BMI sits in that, you know, 26 range and you still, it's considered obese. And, and you, you, the great point, because what I like to tell folks is, is it doesn't live in isolation. Um, you know, a, a death does not live alone. And so just what you mentioned with an NBC, you don't die from an NBC. You die from intracerebral hemorrhage, secondary to blunt force trauma. You die from uh, aortic dissection from blunt force trauma. Then it leads back, and then your eventual causative will likely would be an NBC. But what are the other contributors? What are the other things that they are in that mix? And so when I fill out a death certificate, I'm not just filling out patient died of heart stops. In fact, they get upset if that's what you put down there. The cardiopulmonary arrest, that's, that's a no-no on death certificates, is you, you list kind of what that end result was, that last thing that kind of put it over the edge, but then what led up to that? What was those contributing and what were the outside factors? And then you said, what are other things? And actually, it's a line that's underneath that says, what are other diagnoses that contributed but were not a direct cause on this? So like that, a motor vehicle collision, I'd probably list another cause, you know, something underneath. COVID-19. Well, it, it wasn't why the, the well, car hit the tree. Well, well, but we, don't, we don't know, right? One of the famous ones, I always teach medical students, when they're taking a history on somebody who's passed out, you always ask, has anyone in your family died under the age of 40 for any reason? Because right. there's a condition called Brugada syndrome, right? Which makes you mm -hmm. suddenly pass out. Um, and you'll hear often from them, oh yeah, my uncle Joey died of a car crash. Oh, tell me about the car crash. Oh, this is the strangest thing, man. 
he was driving on a he was driving his motorcycle on a bright sunny day, and he just wiped out in the middle of in the middle of the straightaway. Almost straight away. We think he was speeding or something. No, he passed out. Like, and and so was Brugada the the syndrome? Could COVID-19 have caused this person to go into coughing fit that could have caused a car crash? We don't know. Yeah. And so I'm not saying that you list COVID-19 as the cause of the that. The cause. But, but the other thing to keep in mind, too, and so many of these got, they got corrected because, again, what people fail to remember is we don't have, we, we don't have a, um, a, a, a way to list Farquhar's disease because it hasn't come out yet. Right? <laughs> we didn't have a way to list COVID-19. And so because these are documents that require very specific ways to fill them out to be scientifically valid, there was continuing direction and redirection and then people saying, well, this was a good idea. Oh, wait, we didn't consider that some people would die this way. And so we had to revise how we were doing it. And so, yes, states did have to go back and say, we're going to revise this one because this guy, um, they, they said it was alcohol poisoning, but when we actually looked, he had a viral pneumonia and died on CPAP, and they put it as alcohol poisoning because he was at a 0.4. Mm -hmm. But when we actually now have a diagnostic code that, that, that says COVID, this really looks more like it was uh, acute respiratory failure, secondary to viral pneumonitis, secondary to COVID-19, uh, complicated by uh, acute alcohol intoxication, complicated by alcohol poisoning. And so, yes, we had to go back and we had to do some things. That's not nefarious. Mm -hmm. That's us responding to try and keep the data sets so that we can have science to learn from in a clean way. And, and, that's, and that's necessary. All right. So we've knocked out a bunch of stuff there. And of course, Howie got his blood pressure up. He's got a comorbid condition. <laughs> Thankfully, we're both fully vaccinated and 50 feet from the, the nearest other people that are all masked up right now. Um, wrap things up kind of any take home messages any, anything to go home and then uh, how can folks get in touch with you contact you keep up with you so I'm easy to find I'm on uh, Twitter at, at Dr. Howie Mell that's at D-R-H-O-W-I-E-M-E-L-L -L, or you can email me I'm at howie.mell at gmail.com that's H-O-W-I-E dot M-E-L-L -L at gmail.com um, my final thoughts on this is look guys at the end of the day COVID is scary and it's still scary and it's getting scary. And yes, the, you can argue that the news is causing all the fear and whatever else you wanted to talk about. But at the end of the day, it's scary. And it is so much easier and so much more comfortable to believe that there is a bad guy mm -hmm. somewhere behind a curtain pulling strings, making this all happen. Because if this is all random and not the, caused by a person that we can identify and punish, that means it can happen again tomorrow. And so it's so much easier. It's so much easier to believe that it's somebody doing this for some reason. And that's comforting. And I get it. But that's not real. The reality is we do live in a big, scary world. And we have people who have dedicated their lives. We have public health professionals. We have medical professionals who have dedicated their lives to keeping us safe from this type of thing. The same as we have firefighters who are dedicated their lives to keeping us safe from those ravages. We have emergency workers who dedicate their lives to keeping us safe from hurricanes and tornadoes and all of the other things that Mother Nature can spurn and EMS and, 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 and police and soldiers and all the rest. The reality is bad things do happen. And you have to resist the urge to put a human blame on things and to politicize things that simply aren't political. This is Mother Nature. This is random. And arguing a point to make yourself more comfortable is, is a bad move for ourselves and for our posterity. And the fact that, you know, it, and it, it's, we all look at, and in any situation, we try to find the not me part on why I won't get it or why I'm not at risk or my family's not at risk and whatever it may be, you know, it's gun, you know, that what Lexington right now, they're, they're talking about, um, you know, the, the, the crimes that with, with a lot of a gun crime that's out there. And, and, you know, for us, it's like, well, we don't live in downtown Lexington. We live out in the county somewhere, so we don't really need to worry about it. So that's comforting to my daughters and to my wife that, 
that we may not be down there at risk or saying, you know, listen, it, it, all the all the facts are, are all the evidence is showing that it's, you know, illegal activity that, that's taking place and whatnot. And so, you know, those are all those things that we do as humans to try to make ourselves more comfortable, to say it's not me, that I'm safe from the situation. And this is, I think it's a challenging time right now because we are in this pandemic world that none of us have been through before. And we are all at, theoretically, we're, we're all at risk. And we're all actually becoming more at risk, especially with being unvaccinated because of the changes in this virus. So Howie, once again, thanks for joining me. Glad you're you were here. I was pretty excited that you're like, yep, I'm on my way down from the hotel. I'll be right there. We'll knock this thing out because it's, it's good to have um, side-by-side -side interviews once again. Um, and of course, with you, somebody I've been a good close friend with for as an emergency physician and colleague for you know, pu pushing pushing <laughs> 13 years, years now. Years now. Yeah. yeah. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a long time. Sure. So. Shelly's back room, which we can't do this trip because my wife's with me. Oh, well, <laughs> I appreciate it. And that, that is not, it's not what it sounds like. That is actually a nice little cigar bar and has some nice beverages. So yes, and, and, and if you're not from Washington, D.C., Shelly's back room is not what it would sound like it would be that his <laughs> wife wouldn't let him go to. Yes, no, my wife was a, uh, uh, helped to create uh, the Mayo Clinic's uh, tobacco dependency um, coursework. Uh, Howie, thanks for joining me. And as for me, you can contact me at rstanton at asep.org, rstanton at asep.org. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASEP Frontline.